morning. May we worship together.
You feel welcomed already, don't you? Amen. Welcome to worship. Great time to be together. Those of you that are joining us live streaming, welcome. We want you to give us a wave. And folks here will give each other a wave. Wave and say hello. Yes. Welcome to worship. As uh, Central Baptist Church, we have an order of business uh, to start off in our worship today. I'm going to introduce our moderator, Mike Davenport, to come and lead us through this brief time of uh, uh, Lord's Day vote. Mike. Thank you, Gene. Let, I hereby open our Lord's Day meeting, the purpose of which is to vote on the uh, 2021 church budget, which has been presented to the church at the business meeting. And uh, I'm here to recognize Ed Gibbons, the chairman of the board of directors. <clears throat> the uh, board of directors of Central Baptist Church is requesting that the membership of the Central Baptist Church approve the adoption of the proposed 2021 church ministries budget. Thank you. As you entered the uh, sanctuary this morning, you should have received ballots uh, and now is the time uh, for you to, uh, for the church members to vote on the approval of the uh, budget, and you may deposit those ballots as you leave in the box outside in the uh, sanctuary hall. Um, that concludes the uh, special Lord's Day meeting business this morning. Thank you. This has been a special week. Uh, for all of us as we pray for international missions. And today uh, especially is, uh, is important for a couple of reasons. One reason, if you received your brochure, your prayer uh, booklet of international missions, if you didn't get one, um, it's not too late to start praying for missions. Uh, you can pick one up, uh, they're available uh, in the welcome quarter. But today especially we have a family that's, uh, mission there were missionaries in Italy uh, the Worthies, uh, they, they have a Tennessee connection. They have a couple of their daughters are students at uh, two of our uh, Baptist universities here in Tennessee. So um, they're on our list to pray for uh, today. So pray for the Worthies and their work in Italy. And as we think of uh, missions, we've had a great connection with missions through the years, uh, particularly with the Carter family. I'm gonna ask Charlie to come up now, Bill and Kate Carter served the missionaries uh, in Chile for, uh, he'll tell you, uh, 40 years. And he has a special presentation for Central Baptist Church this morning. It's Charlie Carter. Charlie, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. As Jean stated, uh, my parents were missionaries to Chile in South America for nearly 40 years. And upon their retirement, uh, they uh, returned to Johnson City, this being my mother's hometown, and Central being the home church that we would come back to when we came on furlough. Uh, after retirement, here at the church, my mom volunteered at the library. She sang with a joy choir, which she enjoyed so much. Uh, my father was even an uh, interim pastor for about a year uh, prior to the coming of uh, Dr. Ron Murray. Uh, so today, on behalf of the family and in their memory, uh, I would like to present this picture, uh, which sat over the fireplace in their den uh, to Central Baptist Church. Uh, it was presented to my father uh, when they retired uh, by the uh, Chile Baptist Convention in recognition of their service there. And... Um, I'll be outside later if anyone needs that little plaque translated. I think you should be able to figure it out easily enough. Uh, the picture is embossed copper mounted on a, a wooden 
uh, piece, and um, it depicts a group of fishermen. Luke chapter 5 tells of a day uh, that Jesus was walking along the shore of a lake and is being followed by a large group of people when he saw some boats and just climbed into one of the boats that belonged to Simon, who was over there washing his nets. And he asked him to pull him out into the water so he could speak to the people from there. And after he was through speaking, uh, chapter 4 tells us, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. Now we're not all called to go abroad to the mission field, but we all need to answer the calling to be fishers of men, whether we're here, next door, wherever we might be. Thank you. Thank you Wonderful gift. Let us pray. Our Father, we are most grateful for this beautiful Sunday morning. This wonderful opportunity that you give us to be here in your house with your people. We come this morning to worship you and to adore you because we know that you have first loved us. We thank you for the beauty of this season. But we are most thankful this morning for the beauty of your grace which helps our lives to have been changed and to remain different in our world. Help us, O oh God, on this day to worship you in spirit and in truth, to adore you more fully, to serve you more faithfully. In Christ's name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. O oh, come all ye faithful, joyful, triumphant, come and behold him, Christ the Lord. Would you stand as we say?
We turn now to Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sin. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Today, we light the second candle of the Advent season, representing the love Christ brings to our lives and to the world. reading God's word. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age, my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. You spoke once in a vision and said to your faithful people, I have set the crown upon a warrior and have exalted one chosen out of the people. 
I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil, I anointed him. My hand will hold him fast, and my arm will make him strong. No enemy shall succeed him, nor any wicked man bring him down. I will crush his foes before him, and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and love shall be with him. And he shall be victorious through my name. I shall make his dominion extend from the great sea to the river. He will, will say, say to me, me you are my, my father, father, my God, God and the rock of my salvation. If you notice your congregational care section in your worship folder, you see some concerns on our hearts there, and I'm happy to report that Al Spaller was uh, released to go home yesterday, which is a tremendous answer to our prayers. Al was in the hospital for an extended length of time battling COVID and pneumonia uh, on top of that. We pray also for these who are grieving and for other concerns on our hearts. So shall we bow together? and go before the Lord. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, for the Advent season, the reminder that it is of your love for us, your coming to rescue us. And just as in the days of old, your people had to wait and wait and wait. So we wait today for rescue for relief from our trials and our struggles and the fact that you have come gives us confidence that you will come yet again to complete our redemption to restore us to a full wholeness and brilliance and glory in your wonderful kingdom god we pray today for those on our hearts these we have mentioned and others beyond. We pray for your encouragement. Lord, there is much grief in our nation and in our world today. Losses related to the pandemic, but others as well. We are all stressed. We are all struggling in one way or another. And for some, Lord, it proves too much. We pray for our brothers and sisters who grieve this day. We pray that you would encourage them, encourage those who are working tirelessly night and day to minister to those who are sick and ill. Lord, as our pandemic numbers continue to rise, we are mindful of those on the front lines, our health care workers and medical personnel who are serving so selflessly to relieve suffering, to heal and to mend. And we pray that you would heal and mend their spirits and renew their strength this day. God, we love you. We pray as we continue to worship you that we might recognize your love and grace and extend that same love and grace to others. For your glory and for your sake, we ask it today and always in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. I love those reminders of the season in which we find ourselves. This, of course, is the second Sunday of Advent. And the focus that we are choosing to um, highlight this week is love. Love as the theme uh, for our Advent Sunday today. But our world struggles to understand the meaning of love. They reveal their confusion on the subject in a multitude of ways uh, in, uh, at, at, at all times, it seems. According to Neil Genslinger, there are over 10,000 songs at the United States Copyright Office in Washington, D.C., whose titles begin with the words, Love Is, and the variety of uh, ways in which they answer that question reveals that love is a complex thing and a confusing thing. Uh, let me share a few examples for you from the last century or so that try to define love. One says, love is like a dizziness. Another, love is a sickness full of woes. Love is an IOU. Love is like the influenza. Contagious, I hope. <laughs> love is good for anything that ails you. Love is a dimpling doodle bug. Love is doggone mean. Love is your prescription. Love is a glass of champagne. Love is a bore. Love is psychedelic. Love is groovy. Love is a four-letter word. Love is a five-letter word. Love is for suckers. And on and on and on it goes. But the Bible tells us what love is. In 1 John chapter 4, it says, This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Christmas is all about God's love. The love that motivated Him to send His only Son to us to redeem us. I invite your attention with me this morning to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to look together at verses 7 through 12 and talk about what they say about love on this second Sunday of Advent. I invite you, if you're able to stand with me as I read God's Word for us. 1 John 4, beginning in verse 7. <clears throat> the Bible says, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Thank you. Please be seated. John wrote this little letter to oppose false teachers and to encourage genuine believers, genuine disciples and followers of Christ. And to accomplish that, he presented several tests that can be used to distinguish between false believers and true believers. There is a doctrinal test, which of course is belief in Jesus, we read about that in chapter 2 and 4 and chapter 5. There is a behavioral test, which is obedience. We read about in chapters 2 and 3. And then there is a social test, which is love. And we read about that nearly throughout, verses 2 
through or chapters two through five. And, and if you noticed in this little section of scripture that we read, love, the word love, agape, sacrificial love is used more than a dozen times just in those few verses. In verses 7 and 8, John talks about the person who truly knows God. Now, the word know here reflects the Hebrew sense of an ongoing intimate fellowship with God. Dallas Willard calls it interactive relationship. That's what it means to know God. And knowing God is, in a way, the recurrent theme of 1 John. It's spoken of over 77 times. And these two verses, 7 and 8, tell us that the true evidence of knowing God is living a lifestyle of love. That's how we can recognize that we know God. Loving others is the indication that we really do know God because God is love. When uh, terrorists make the news because they undertake their acts of hatred and murder in the name of God, they simply prove that they don't know the first thing about God, because God is love. Anytime we behave selfishly and, and concerned for ourselves above others and their needs and their concerns, we reveal that we don't know God, because God is love. Now, the Bible is not saying that love is God, mind you, as some fuzzy thinkers might believe. There are a lot of, of poor thinkers out there who will tell you that love is God, and if you, if you know love, well, then you know God. No, it says God is love, and that's something very different indeed. God is is love, not the other way around. Now, John also says later in chapter 4 that God is spirit. And in chapter 1, he says that God is light. But even those descriptors don't reveal God's true nature as fully as the statement, God is love. It's an essential part of God's nature and character. It reflects who he is and what he does. Theologian Belden Lane recounts a Jewish legend about the location of the first temple in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and the legend goes like this. Time before time, when the world was young, two brothers shared a field and a mill. Each night they would divide the grain they had ground together during the day. One brother lived alone, the other had a wife and a large family. Now the single brother thought to himself one day, it isn't fair that we divide the grain evenly. I have only myself to care for, but my brother has children to feed. So each night he would secretly take some of his grain to his brother's granary to see that his brother was never without. But the married brother said to himself one day, It isn't really fair that we divide the grain evenly, because I have children to provide for me in my old age, but my brother has no one. What will he do when he's old? So every night he secretly took some of his grain to his brother's granary, and as a result, both of them always found their supply of grain mysteriously replenished every morning. Until one night, they happened to run into one another as they were going to each other's granaries, and they recognized each other and realized all of a sudden what had been happening. And they threw their arms around one another and embraced one another in love, seeing one another in their true light. And the legend is that God witnessed their meeting and proclaimed, this is a holy place, a place of love, and here it is that my temple shall be built. And according to the legend, the first Jewish temple was built on that spot in Jerusalem. Now, even though that's just a legend, it accurately reflects the heart of God. God is love. 
And it goes on in the scripture to tell us that we are the objects of God's love. We see that in what God did for us. Now, typically and historically, religion has been about humankind seeking God. <clears throat> and if you study the, the religions of the world, you see that. They are, they're all in a pursuit, a search to find God. But Christianity is just the opposite. Christianity reveals God as reaching down and seeking us in our sin, in our lostness, to rescue us, to redeem us, motivated by his love. He loves us. That's the amazing truth. Not our love for God, but God's love for us. It's astounding. It's amazing. It's astonishing that God would love us. And he has clearly shown that he loves us by sending his only son to die in our place. What John says in this text in one way, the Apostle Paul says in Romans in another, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Love is an action. It's not just a feeling. And that action is sacrifice on behalf of the one who is loved. We, as the objects of God's love, are the beneficiaries of God's sacrifice on our behalf through Jesus Christ. That's what love does. It sacrifices for the one it loves. You parents know this. I don't have to explain this to you, do I? You sacrifice for your children because you love them because you want good things for them. You want them to succeed. You want them to prosper. And so you sacrifice on their behalf. A few years ago, the United States Department of Agriculture put out an interesting report called Expenditures on Children by Families. And in that report, it said that middle-income parents of a child born in 2013 can expect to spend about $245,340 for food, shelter, education, other necessities to raise that child through their first 18 years of life. And that doesn't even include college. $243,000. Now, someone else said that for the same money you could buy a brand new Ferrari Italia. So... Uh, if any of you young people see your parents gazing out into the driveway at the Ford and the Chevy looking wistful, you better do something nice for them pretty quick. We sacrifice for those we love. God sent his son because he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God does not want us to perish but to live. Verse 9 says, God sent his son into the world that we might live through him. Might live, it says. Take note of that because that expression in the Greek text is in the subjunctive, meaning it's, it, it has a contingent nature to it. It implies contingency. That is, if we respond to Christ in faith, then... We can live through him. The purpose of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that first Christmas, was eternal life and abundant life for us. Jesus later said, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Have it to the full. That's why Christ came. Have you responded to Christ in faith? Believing that God sent him to save you. Passing that doctrinal test. And then making him the Lord of your life. Passing the obedience test. You know, we've heard an awful lot this year. No one's going to tell me what to do. But you can't be saved unless you're willing to say, Jesus... You tell me what to do. Unless we're willing to say that, we can't be saved. 
I read that in a, in a, a devotional thought. A friend of my old seminary buddy of mine, a, a pastor in Texas, wrote. I read it this morning. He said, a lot of people want to go to heaven. They know that heaven's better than hell. They're willing to confess Jesus as their Savior. But they don't seem to realize that Jesus also must be Lord. And that means we have to let him tell us what to do. Have you done that? In verse 11, John says, Friends, since God so loved us, sacrificially, we also ought to love one another. That's God telling us what to do. Love one another. We should seek to be like our Lord who loved us. To know God is to love as He loves. That's the evidence that we know God if we love one another. Sacrificially obediently. It shows that we pass the test. And when we love one another, verse 12 says, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. The New American Standard, Revised Standard Version, other translations render that as God's love being perfected in us. Now what does that look like? God's love perfected in us through loving one another. Well, I hope you'll allow me to retell a true story recounted by uh, Rabbi Pesach Krohn in his 1999 book, Echoes of the Magid. In Brooklyn, New York, there's a school that caters to learning disabled children. At a fundraising dinner for the school, a father of one of those children delivered an astonishing speech. He extolled the virtues of the school. He praised the, the leaders there for their sacrifice on behalf of those children. But then he asked, where is the perfection in my son, Shia? Everything God does, he said, is done with perfection. But my child can't understand things as other children do. My child can't remember facts and figures the way other children do. Where is God's perfection? And it shocked everyone. It made them uncomfortable. It was a bit of an awkward moment. They didn't know where he was going with that. And then he said, I believe that when God brings a child like this into the world, the perfection that God seeks is in the way people react to this child. And then he went on to tell a story of something that had happened. And one afternoon, he and Shia were walking past a park where some boys that Shia knew were playing baseball. And Shia saw that, and he asked his father, do, do you think they would let me play? Well, Shia's father knew that most of those boys wouldn't want him on their team. But he understood that if Shia were allowed to, to play, to do something, that it would give him a sense of belonging. It would lift his spirits. It would make him feel less different. So he went over to the sandlot where this pickup baseball game was going on, and he asked one of the boys there in the field whether Shia might be able to play. And the boy looked around for guidance from his teammates. There weren't any coaches out there. His teammates didn't give him any indication. So he took matters into his own hands. He said, well, we're losing by six runs. The game's already in the eighth inning. I guess he can be on our team. We'll try to put him up to bat in the, in the ninth inning. So Shia was put, told to put on a glove, and he was sent out into the outfield. In the bottom of the eighth inning, Shia's team scored a few runs, but they were still behind by three. In the bottom of the ninth inning, wouldn't you know, Shia's team scored again. Now they had two outs, and the bases were loaded. The potential winning runs were on base, and it was Shia's turn to bat. Would they actually let him do it? Well, surprisingly, they did, even though Shia didn't even know how to hold the bat, much less hit with it. And as he stepped up to the plate, the 
opposing pitcher stepped a little closer to the plate himself and gently lobbed the ball towards Shia. He clumsily swung at it, but of course he missed. And so one of Shia's teammates came up to him, and together they, they held the bat and faced the pitcher. And so the pitcher again stepped a little closer and, and carefully lobbed the ball toward them, and Shia and his teammates swung at the ball, and they managed to hit a a, a slow grounder right toward the pitcher who fielded it easily. He could have thrown it to first base and gotten Shia out and won the game. But instead, he threw the ball in a high arc way over the first baseman's head out into right field. And everybody began to yell, Shia, Shia, run to first. And Shia, shocked and wide-eyed, began to scamper toward first. Shia had never run to first in his life. And by then, the right fielder had retrieved the ball. He could have thrown it to the second baseman, but instead, he throw it, threw it far over the third baseman's head while everyone yelled, Shia, run to second. And so Shia ran to second. And after he got to second, the opposing shortstop helped him turn and pointed him toward third. And, and everyone on both teams began to yell, Shia, run to third, run to third, which he did as the opposing team continued to purposely fumble the ball. And finally, after he rounded third, as all of the other runners ahead of him crossed home plate, they yelled to Shia, Shia, run home! And he did with all of the players on both teams following him and shouting, run Shia, run! And when he crossed home plate, he became the hero of the game because he had hit a grand slam home run and won the game for his team. And all of the players on both teams lifted him on their shoulders and sang his praises. And there were more than just nine winners on the field that day. And there were 18. And Shia's father finished his story with tears rolling down his face saying that day, those 18 boys reached their level of perfection. God's love made perfect. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. Sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for us. So, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That's my final exhortation to you today. Love one another. It's the perfect gift. And one size fits all. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, forgive us for not being obedient to your command to love one another. God, we, we want to know you. We want to know your heart. We see glimpses of it in things that take place around us. We see it clearly in your sacrifice on our behalf in sending your Son vulnerable, innocent, to a manger in Bethlehem, preparing to die for us. God, I pray that you might move in us, not only today, but throughout this Advent season and into the coming year, to put our love into action, we might be willing to make the sacrifices to do what Jesus tells us to do. That his name might be lifted high and above all else that plagues us in this fallen world. Make it so, God. We pray it all in his name. Amen. We're going to sing and think 
of God's love for us today. And reflect, I pray, on what that calls us to do. Since God has so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And I hope you'll take that to heart today and always. Let's stand to our feet now. As Tony comes and lead us, let's sing. that you will reflect the love of God this week, this Christmas season, throughout our days and our nights, our weeks, our months, our years, so that it will be known to one and all that you know God. The one who loves knows God. The one who does not does not know God because God is love. I invite you back to the four pianos concerts that are happening later today. There will be one at 3 o'clock, one at 6 o'clock. Um, when this space fills, if it does, we'll have overflow space upstairs in the, the youth area. You can also watch it online at home via streaming, the way we do our worship services. Those of you watching now at home, be aware of that if you want to do that. Um, a, a number of folks have prepared long and hard for this, and we pray that it goes well. Uh, we'll be doing it safely, just as we do these worship services. And uh, by the way, keep monitoring the website. We have a number of activities and services planned for the Christmas season. But uh, as you all know, the, the numbers are going up. And we have a, a subcommittee of medical professionals and leaders who are monitoring all of that. And they are advising us. At any moment, we could be uh, in a position where we have to cancel something. So uh, keep an eye, keep tabs on the website so that you'll be aware. Uh, things change rapidly, as you know, in the midst of all of these things that we've experienced this year. But thank God, the one thing that doesn't change is our God. And uh, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we give him thanks for that. Before we go, let's pray and ask for his blessing as we depart. God, we do love you. We thank you for your love for us. And we pray that those around us would see your love in us as we care for them and care for one another. Uh, you told us that by this will all men know that we are your disciples, that we love one another. And I pray we would demonstrate that, that you would be glorified and lifted up. Now, God, go with us, guide our steps, keep us safe. Keep us in your love, and whether we live or die, we will give you the praise and the thanks always and forevermore. 
In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. You are dismissed.